भद्रम कर्णे शृणुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्येक्षजत्रा स्थिरंगुष्टवागुम सस्तनु व्यशेम देवित यदायु स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्ववेदा स्वस्ति नस्ताक्षो अरिष्टने स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओं शाति 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 ओं ओ गॉड्स मे वी हियर ऑस्पिशियस वर्ड्स विथ आर इयर्स वेल एंगेज इन सैक्रिफाइसिस मे वी सी ऑस्पिशियस थिंग्स विथ आर आईज वाइल प्रेजिंग द गॉड्स विथ स्टडी लिम्स मे वी एंजॉय अ लाइफ दैट इज बेनिफिशियल टू द गॉड्स मे इंद्र ऑफ एंशियन फेम बी ऑस्पिशियस टू अस May the all-knowing Pusha, God of the earth, be propitious to us. May Garuda, the destroyer of evil, be well disposed towards us. May Brihaspati ensure our welfare. Om, peace, peace, peace. So in this section of the Mundaka Upanishad, which we were seeing, there is a recapitulation of the method of um, of um, Jnana Yoga, the way of knowledge of Vedanta. And then it will be followed by practices which will help us to attain enlightenment. And finally, the results of enlightenment. So this is the outline. The bulk of the teachings, the main thrust of the teachings have already been given in the earlier sections. However, here there is a recapitulation of that presented in another way. The teaching has been presented in a different way and this way is very famous the way of the two birds so the body is a tree and on which there are two like two birds sitting on a tree there is the uh, there is god and the human the divine and the human so there is um, pure consciousness the witness consciousness and the jiva the lower bird is engaged in experiencing the fruits on the tree the sweet and bitter fruits and then when it gets a shock it looks up and sees the radiant higher bird which is just there sitting and and watching and not eating of the fruits of the tree and of course this is the reference to our experiences the fruits of karma which we have done in this and past lives and we are experiencing the pleasant and unpleasant results of what we have done and in doing so we generate fresh karma which will give rise to future fruits also now um when the lower bird becomes aware of the higher bird and thinks that's so majestic so peaceful so fulfilled um can i become like that and starts approaching the higher bird then it gets distracted again by some other fruits and uh, going on in this way finally it gets a big shock eats a particularly bitter fruit maybe and then makes a steady movement towards the higher bird as it approaches the higher bird the radiance of the higher bird engulfs it and suddenly it realizes there was always the higher bird all along there was no lower bird at all so the whole thing was a process of spiritual evolution that our real nature is the only one that exists it seems to be this limited being uh, going through life and experiencing everything until we realize what we truly are and then you know that saying is there um you do not get the, the person does not get freedom but you get freedom from the person the person is the lower bird and the higher bird is always free and it is our real nature in another way sri ramakrishna used to say pointing towards his own body here there are two there is the mother and there is the child there is god and the devotee of god here there are two it's a, an echo of the uh, upanishadic simile of the two birds actually then after this was completed we came to mantra number 4 that's where we stopped last time mantra number 4 says the nature of the realization what what is realized the nature of non dual realization prano yesha ya sarva bhutair vibhati vijanan vidwan bhavate nati vadi atma krida atma rati kriyavan esha brahma vidam varishta so the ultimate reality paramatma the supreme self is realized and 
as you know you realize it as satchidananda i am existence consciousness bliss i am that at the same time sarva bhute vibhati that itself shines as everything here see this is non duality realizing that i am the witness consciousness beyond body and mind that's step 1 but that's not non duality that's still separation non duality is oneness not two so when you realize that one consciousness alone is all of this the entire universe is one with us so sarva bhute vibhati it blazes forth vibhati shines variously in all these other human beings and other living beings and indeed even the non living universe all of it is that same paramatma that same prana here the word prana is used to indicate the paramatma the ultimate reality you realize that vidwan the one who realizes vijanan who knows this knows this means in reality not theoretically not as a speculation bhavate nati vadi very interesting terminology does not become or stops being a tall talker or does not become a tall talker it's the enlightened one who falls silent who sees after all what will you say the true nature brahman our real nature one cannot speak of it whatever one says will be an approximation will be an indication uh, cannot you cannot exactly denote it by language it's beyond language and as far as the world is concerned even there whatever we say is never quite true um so the enlightened one falls silent I mean, not that it's completely silent may may talk if necessary but is no longer interested in disputations and speculations and uh, lectures and you know or trying to teach people not at all falls silent at and then uh, some characteristics atma krida atma rati completely absorbed in samadhi in the real nature that i am brahman the ability to withdraw to shut down engagement with the world that's one on the other hand with eyes open engaging with the world atma krida playing as if playing with um, with pure consciousness everywhere it's a uh, uh, engagement seeing the non dual reality in everybody in everything and engaging with them kriya van fully active so it's not a kind of quietism the upanishad itself says kriya van fully active will probably continue to do whatever he was doing sri ramakrishna put it this way a clerk was once jailed for something he did and then when he was real, uh, released from jail um sri ramakrishna asks so what will the clerk do will he dance around like a madman or will he go back to his job he'll go back to his job of course similarly you attain enlightenment externally you may still be the same person uh, same person in the sense that you'd be a transformed person you'd be a saint but as far as action is concerned if you were studying meditating um you would continue studying meditating teaching maybe if you were holding a job and looking after a family or like king janaka administering a, a kingdom you will still continue to do that it's not that now i'm enlightened i'm going to make a dramatic change in my life no uh, you're seeing the same reality here and there there's this story who about a modern gyani nisargadatta maharaj so the story i like when he became enlightened Uh, he used to live in an area which is i used to think it was a, a slum in mumbai but it's not a slum but close to a slum and and a very uh, like a difficult neighborhood um so he thought why live in this nasty place anymore um i have got it what i you know what one needs to realize in human life i've got it and so let me go to the himalayas and live the rest of my life in the mountains he started and then he stopped he thought what am i doing what is it that i'll find there in the lofty noble himalayas and which is not here in this crowded polluted noisy place it's the same reality everywhere and so he stayed stayed put exactly where he was he had a little shop uh, where he sold homemade cigarettes it seems and beedies beedi <laughs> and uh, he stayed in that uh, same place the rest of his life this is sign of agyani makes no external change kriya van continues to be engaged in action even spiritual practices meditation silence um maybe even ritualistic worship after enlightenment a person the enlightened one may continue to do that however internally there will be a difference 
earlier, we were all doing it in order to attain, attain enlightenment, in order to attain jnana, knowledge. However, after enlightenment, the person continues to do that as a manifestation of his enlightenment, not in order to do it, not as a practice for getting something. There is a beautiful story of Swami Jagadananda, who was long before my time. I never saw him. He was a disciple of Masharada. You know, there is this book, Sri Ramakrishna, the Great Master. The Bengali is Sri Sri Ramakrishna Leela Prasanga. It's a very authentic biography of Sri Ramakrishna written by Swami Saradananda. So nowadays, of course, there is a very lucid tra English translation made by Swami Chetanananda, which is available. Everybody reads that. But before that, there was another English translation, a little bit old, archaic kind of, you know, old British English. And that translation was made by Swami Jagadananda. Uh, so that Swami Jagadananda, who, who was regarded in his lifetime as a Brahma Jnani, as a knower of Brahman, enlightened person. So there's this very cute little anecdote I heard about him. In his old age, he used to live in our ashram. Uh, there's a place called Dehradun in India. So near Dehradun, there's a uh, suburbs of Dehradun. There's a place called Kishanpur. I hear now it's all part of the same city now. The city has become bigger. So he used to live in that ashram. It was a small and beautiful ashram. I've been there. So, and what he would do is, one of the things he would do in his old age, um, he would go and collect flowers from the garden for the daily worship of Sri Ramakrishna in the temple. Now that's something which we as novices would do. You know, the brahmacharis who are newcomers or volunteers, devotees, we would arrange for the puja. Um, why would such a senior Swami and so revered and, you know, everybody reveres him and people speak in harsh tones about him being an enlightened person. Why does he do the simplest of things like, uh, you know, collecting flowers for the daily worship? So one day, a uh, novice couldn't, a brahmachari, a newcomer, he couldn't contain his curiosity and he asked the Swami, Swami, why do you do this, you know, bring flowers for the daily worship. So it seems the Swami just smiled. It, it, it seems uh, he had this most wonderful smile. He was a very toweringly tall man and thin and fair. And he looked down at the brahmachari and smiled. And he said, then you tell me what I should do. In Bengali, he said, Tahole tumi bolo ami ki korbo. Uh, a very sweet reply, was not a put down. It's indicating something. The brahmachari has in his mind, the novice has in his mind, such a revered, great Vedantic Swami. Probably the thing for him to do would be to, you know, study the Upanishads and teach the Upanishads and sit and meditate all day, all day long. Why do such a, pre a very preliminary little uh, ritual like collecting flowers? Not even the puja in the temple. Collecting flowers for the puja in the temple. But from his perspective, it is all the same. Every activity uh, he does is uh, irradiated with the presence of the non-dual divinity uh, by one non-dual uh, Brahman or pure consciousness. So, Kriyavan, fully engaged in action. Brahma Vidam Varishta, such a one is the best or the highest among the knowers of Brahman. So, among the knowers of Brahman also there is a categorization. I may explained it last time. That depending on the degree of absorption uh, in in Brahman. But here, it is the one who expresses its realization to the fullest possible uh, extent. Fully satisfied in Brahman, in the Atman, or by himself, not needing the company of others, not needing engagement, completely, not even needing the body. I have seen a monk um, who was paralyzed, both legs paralyzed and his eyes, he was blind. And one of the happiest, uh, most alive persons I have seen, amazing person, never without a word of good cheer for everybody around, he couldn't see them. You would have to go and identify yourself, say that I am so and so. He was a very senior monk. He was a disciple of Swami Vigyanandaji. So I saw him uh, in the main monastery at Belur and in the hospital when he was ill. Um, I mean, he taught me what is bodilessness. In that broken, sick body, not one complaint, not even one acknowledgement that it's, it's a problem to him. It isn't. 
and he's always there to encourage and even scold us and you know uh, hurry us along you know, on the spiritual path i uh, it's astonishing we have it so much better and we are full of care and complaint and <laughs> grudging and grumbling and this person uh, with a broken body at the fag end of his life this old old monk uh, in one sense there is doesn't have any relatives any property nobody not famous nobody to look after him and he is extremely happy i'll tell you one story about him and uh, this this swami i forget his sanyas name um once we heard that somebody came and told us i was a brahmachari in the training center that that swami uh, his japa mala rosary is lost so now what happened was since he was blind there was a boy who took care of him and uh, he would give him the rosary the japa mala to count the beads to repeat the mantra and the swami would lie on the bed and with the rosary on his chest and he would repeat the mantra when he was done that boy would take the um, rosary and put it before the pictures of sri ramakrishna shma sharada and swami vivekananda and there would be flowers the flowers would be arranged by that boy and his duty was every day in the morning he would come and remove the old flowers throw it in the in the ganga in the ganges and put new flowers now you can imagine what happened so the rosary was kept there under the flowers and so this boy one day came and picked up the flowers along with the rosary and tossed it in the in the ganga and the rosary had been given to this swami so many time so many years ago decades ago a lifetime ago by none other than swami vigyanananda the disciple of sri ramakrishna and was thrown away into the ganga so we rushed i and one of my masters uh, teacher swami jushtanandi ji so we rushed to the uh, place where the old monks were staying we went into his room he was as usual lying on the bed eyes closed and the, my teacher he said to this i was too junior to speak to such a revered monk i just stood by and listened my teacher he said to the swami that i am so and so and i have got um, a brahmacharya novice with me and we heard what happened please don't worry we will get a new rosary for you and will be purified by none other than the president of the order will i'll come in shortly and give it to you and the old swami said there is no need of that its task is done now that's a very profound statement that means the task of repeating the mantra why the practice its purpose has been achieved it's done then he said if you can could you get somebody to read out from the upanishads and the gita to me this stuff for him reading it out i am quite sure it just meant pointing to a reality which was always there ever available to him you know it's just drawing his attention to what he knew for us it's speculative or theoretical for him it was a fact so he said can you get somebody to read to me and my teacher the swami he he said i'll come myself maharaj swami i'll come myself and i'll read to you so this is this person they are ever engaged they are the high, greatest knowers of brahman now the next mantras 5 and 6 they talk about practices what is necessary for enlightenment what are the practices necessary for enlightenment let's see satyena labhya tapasayesha atma samyak jnanena brahmacharyena nityam anta sharire jyotirmayo hi shubhro yang pashyanti yatayakshina dosha very beautiful mantra the bright and pure self within the body that the monks with habitual effort and attenuated blemishes see is attainable through truth concentration complete knowledge and continence practiced constantly all right what's said here spiritual practices truth austerities um knowledge chastity practice constantly and uh, so what does it mean in vedanta there are two kinds of practices inner and outer um, antaranga bahiranga inner and outer the inner practices are directly re- related to knowledge to realization to enlightenment the inner practices are the well known most familiar to us um hearing 
reasoning, meditation, shavana, manana, nididhyasana. For example, what we are doing now is part of the inner practices. The actual teaching, then you reason it out and then contemplate on the clarity so gained. That's the inner practice. But there are certain necessary um, so-called outer practices, preliminaries, preparations, necessary practices. They may not be sufficient to give you enlightenment, but they are necessary. Without them, enlightenment is not possible. And the inner practices, the study of Vedanta, will not bear fruit unless those outer practices are held on to. What are they? First and foremost, truth, integrity, honesty, truth. Shankaracharya gives two definitions, one here and one in the next mantra. Here he says the negative definition. Mrishavadanatyaga, giving up false speech, deceit. So at the level of action, at the level of speech and at the level of thought, giving up all falsity, deceit, falsehood. See, morality and spirituality. It is true that there is a distinction, but one must never forget there is a very tight connection between the two. It, one cannot be spiritual without being moral. The person who is moral may not be spiritual, but one thing one has to notice, if one sticks consistently, makes a great effort to lead a righteous life, that will lead to spirituality. But the reverse is not true. If one tries to be spiritual without being righteous, without being moral, ethical, uh, then one cannot be spiritual. One cannot have God without being good. One can be good without being particularly interested in God, although the claim is if one makes a huge effort to be good, in, it's always a struggle, then one will become spiritual. That, that is, it will happen. Satya, and the core of it all is truth. What holds it all together is truth. Sri Ramakrishna famous, famously said, the austerities, tapasya, for this age, the age of Kali, this age, our dark age, material age, he said there's one practice, which is honesty, truth. Truth is the one thing to hold on to. There is that um, famous prayer of Sri Ramakrishna where he gives everything to the mother. Mother, here is thy knowledge and thy ignorance. Knowledge and ignorance, he says. Here is thy, um, uh, here is thy so-called purity and impurity. And like this, he keeps on giving. Um, but he says he could, not, he could not say, Mother, here is thy truth and thy falsity. No. He says, if I give up the truth, then where will I be? If we are looking for the ultimate reality, which is defined as Sat, reality itself, truth itself, then in our day-to-day -day life, we must hold on to the truth. How can we aim for the ultimate truth of the universe, the ultimate reality here, if we cannot hold on to truth in our conventional lives, in our daily, in our quotidian lives? So Satya, Satyena Labhya, uh, enlight is very clear here. Enlightenment is attained to truth. Then tapasa by uh, austerities. There are various kinds of austerities. You know, vigils at night, fasting, um, restricting one's diet. Um, so many kinds of austerities. But here Shankaracharya in his commentary, he focuses on one. And he says, Austerity, the highest austerity, highest tapasya is a very broad word in Indian spiritual life, tapasya. The highest austerity, highest tapasya is concentration, its focus. It is to pay attention. How interesting. In this day of distraction, the age of distraction, he says the greatest spiritual practice you can do is to pay attention, it is, is to focus. Let me read Shankaracharya's comment here, in his commentary. Indriya mana ekagrataya tapasa. By the focus of the senses and mind. Don't let your eyes flicker around seeing this, seeing that. Don't let your ears listen to a little bit of this and a little bit of that. We have this problem of um, flickering attention these days. This, and that's due to, partly at least due to this wonderful technology we have, especially the phones and social media and all, we tend to have 
um, there's a new phenomenon. It's called the phenomenon of intermittent attention. Intermittent attention. And people everywhere, in boardrooms, in classrooms, people are familiar with it. And that It's not that people in, in the job, in the boardroom, in a meeting are not paying attention. They are paying attention, but only once in a while. It's not that uh, the students in the classroom are not paying attention to the teacher. They are, but only once in a while. I've myself seen this at a place no less than Harvard University. Sometimes I would sit back in big lectures, like big lecture halls, sit at the back, you can look down and everybody, you can see the kids, they're studying and they're listening to the teacher. They all have their screens open before them. Um, I somehow think this having laptops and phones in the classroom is sometimes more of a nuisance than a, than a help, actually. Anyway, now what I noticed was interesting that uh, these kids were pretty serious. They're pretty smart kids. But the work ethic now, or the study ethic now is, you listen to the teacher, and then you look it up on the screen, what the teacher is saying. Maybe you do a little bit of search about what the teacher is saying. And then from that search, go on to something else. It's not related to the class. And then come back again to what the teacher is saying. And that goes on throughout the one hour class, class or one and a half hour class. And this is in classrooms. This is in um, workplace everywhere. This is called the phenomenon of intermittent attention. This won't do. The most valuable commodity that we have is attention. The eminent psychologist, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, who wrote the book Flow, his whole life's purpose was to search for the mental states which are um, indicative of the best, you know, the highest quality life when we are at our most fulfilled, um, what Maslow had called peak experiences or close to peak experiences. And he called these flow states. And the common characteristic of all flow states, whether it's a tennis player, that's the example he used, or it's a chess player, or it's a person studying, or it's a person uh, painting, whatever we are doing, um, or a surgeon doing surgery, the, the common denominator of all these flow states, our peak states, are uh, undivided attention. Undivided attention. Uh, when our attention is focused on a challenging and fulfilling task. All of these are important. A kid might be playing a, a, a video game with undivided attention, but that's not a flow state because it's ultimately not fulfilling. It has to be a challenging and fulfilling task, uh, an enriching task, and it should demand our entire attention. Then it's a flow state. And he said, those states are the most valuable states of our life. That's when we are at our happiest, most engaged, most fulfilled. Uh, and those states have become increasingly rare and disturbed because, partly because of this, the life that we are leading nowadays, uh, partly because of this technology also. Then uh, Shankaracharya quotes from the Mahabharata, Manasas Chendriyanam cha hiyaikagriyam paramam tapaha. Mahabharata says that, uh, this is a verse from Mahabharata, which says the highest spiritual practice, the highest tapasya, is the focusing of the mind and the senses. Is So you focus on something, cut out other distractions, and hold that focus. Three things. Pay attention, hold that attention, and cut out everything else. So, and this is also there in Manusmriti, this verse which also says focus or concentration is the highest spiritual practice. In another place, Shankaracharya in his book, Upadesha Sahasri, A Thousand Teachings, there he says, uh, the purpose of all spiritual austerities, tapasya, the purpose of all spiritual austerities is to attain this one-pointed focus on spiritual matters. And he explains why, Shankaracharya, he says, tadhi anukulam, Atma darshana abhimuka bhavat paramam sadhanam tapo netarat um, chandrayanadi. So he says, because it, that state of mind, that intensely focused state of mind, is most amenable, is the most suitable state of mind for enlightenment talker. The realization of the self, I am that. The most suitable state of mind is the intensely focused state of mind, the calm, steady, uh, focused state of mind. 
that is most congenial to the rising of enlightenment. And then he says, not other austerities, uh, like he gives example of fasting. Chandrayana is a kind of fasting. It's increasing um, your, uh, decreasing your food intake with the waning of the moon and then increasing it back to normal with the uh, reappearance of the moon. So this is a kind of fasting. Fasting, all kinds of other austerities, those are secondary. They're not bad. The secondary. The most important thing is this intensely holding on, whether it's your mantra, whether it's Vedantic study, whether it's the self-inquiry, whatever it is, whether it is following your breath, whatever it is, your spiritual practice, focusing on that. Sister Nivedita says about Vivekananda that we did not see him often engaging in any particular spiritual practices other than meditation, but his whole life was of such an intensity of, of uh, focus, intensity of concentration on, on the, the highest truth. It, it was a, almost a fearful intensity. So you, that is the highest spiritual practice. You don't need anything else. If you're constantly centered on God, that's the highest focus. Then what else? So focus. Then brahmacharyena. Uh, this is celibacy. Brahmacharya is the control of the senses in general, but particularly celibacy because it is in the uh, sexual act that the mind is most tremendously disturbed. Nerves and the mind are most tremendously uh, exteriorized and shaken. So um, chastity has been praised in all spiritual traditions everywhere. And of course, this depends on context. So there is one kind of set of rules of chastity for monks, monastics. There is another kind for householders. So for householders, it might be respecting the, the, uh, the sanctity of marriage. Um, also, Sri Ramakrishna said to his householder devotees that after the birth of one or two children, live like brother and sister. So there is an importance of celibacy or chastity in spiritual life. And then, so these three, truth, this austerity consisting of, of uh, attention, focus, holding on, keeping your mind on spiritual matters. And third, uh, chastity. These three, um, and these three are exterior. This is the righteousness, the morality, which is foundational for spiritual life. And then he says, Samya Jnana by adequate or complete knowledge. What does this complete knowledge mean? Remember, it's a practice. It can't mean enlightenment. That, that's what we are looking for. So what, not, what does this knowledge mean? This is a footnote given by Swami Gambhirananda, where he says, by samya jnana, adequate knowledge, it is meant to be, under, it is understood such immature but adequate knowledge of the meaning of the text, which matures into the knowledge of the thing itself. The mature knowledge, productive of direct perception, does not depend on other factors for bringing about its results, namely the cessation of ignorance. So it is immature knowledge that alone can be combined with such disciplines as truth, etc. for the accusation of mature knowledge. All right. What it basically means is Shravana Manana Nididhyasana. This, uh, this complete knowledge, Samya Jnana, it means the knowledge that is acquired by Listening to Vedanta, teaching, studying the text, then reasoning it out for yourself, and then dwelling on it. And so uh, a clarity will be attained. And that deepens into the, the real arising of enlightenment, the realization, I am Brahman. That, that knowledge will remove all ignorance. That does not depend on anything else. Uh, once that, clarifying, that uh, enlightenment uh, arises, that breakthrough arises. In technical terms, it's called Brahmakara Vritti, the, the modification of the mind in the form I am Brahman. That realization comes. The veils drop away and the clarity in it shines forth undeniably. I am that. That does not depend on any other practice. Once that arises, that will dispel ignorance and you are free. You realize that you are Brahman. But before that, there is a stage when we are cultivating this knowledge. 
when we are studying Vedanta, we are reasoning it out and we are getting some clarity and dwelling on that clarity and trying to make it um, effortless and natural for us. All that, that stage of knowledge, it requires the support of truth and um, concentration and uh, chastity. All of those supporting factors are absolutely necessary. Otherwise, this, this knowledge will not arise at all. That's what's meant. Then Shang uh, the mantra says, Nityam, constantly. And Shankaracharya makes a big deal about this constantly. It says, constantly is like a lamp, which is, the word constantly is like a lamp, which is placed on your doorstep. And it illumines your, uh, the, uh, the outside of your room and the inside of your room too. So it illumines both ways. What it means is, this word nityam, it, uh, it should be connected to all the other words there. That means, satyena nityam, nityena. That means, constant practice of truth. You can't say, I am truthful, only occasionally I tell a few lies. Then that's not the truth that's being referred to here. It's a constant attempt to hold on to the truth. Um, and that will lead to struggle, and that will lead to, it requires courage, and it requires us to maybe accept some sacrifice and loss. You might disappoint some people. You might incur financial or career-wise um, you know, losses or blows. It might happen. Mahatma Gandhi, remember, he was a householder. He had children. He had to earn his living. He took up these cases uh, as a lawyer, and he made sure that he only uh, he, he stuck to the truth as a lawyer, which is very difficult to do. And so, but he made, uh, it was a principle. And he was respected for that. But it's also true that he was not a particularly successful lawyer. So, uh, that much, if you ask him by his uh, standards, he would consider himself very successful. Because he would see whether he is capable of holding on to the truth or not. If he holds on to the truth, he would think, I am successful. It's not an amount of money he makes or the cases he gets. So, satyena, nityena, that is, constantly uh, holding on to the truth. Then, focus, a constant focus on spiritual matters. Your study of Vedanta, your meditation, uh, your, uh, you know, it's constantly thinking about that. Swami Suhitanandaji, who is our vice president now, for many years he served a great monk, Swami Premeshananda who was a disciple of Masharata and who was regarded in his lifetime as an enlightened person. So one day, Swaita and just as, an, as a test, the old Swami was lying in bed, he was ill. So this monk who was very young at that time, he, he said, uh, he was a novice. So he said, just as a test, he suddenly asked that old Swami, what are you thinking just now? Just now, what are you thinking? And the Swami immediately said, because he was lying with his eyes closed, uh, he immediately said, without any hesitation, Sarvabhyapi Sri Ramakrishna, all pervading Sri Ramakrishna. Uh, and of course, Suhitanji, I think he asked, if I remember correctly, he asked, how can Sri Ramakrishna, because Sri Ramakrishna, we see him in the picture, you know, this man with the beard sitting uh, in meditation posture in this, in this picture. How can this man be all-pervading? And uh, the old Swami smiled and said, you'll understand in time. But see, at any time you catch this person, right now what are you thinking about? Right now, tell me right now. And he says, I'm thinking about God. So this constant focus on that reality. You might think it's very boring or very difficult. It might be very boring or difficult for us. For them it's not. It's where they dwell uh, effortlessly. Um, and then chastity. Uh, it is constant uh, chastity. Unbroken chastity. Then what happens if one practices in this way with this moral foundation of truth, with the austerity of constant focus and unbroken chastity, then what happens? You And you persist in your Vedantic inquiry. Um, listening, reflecting, and meditating. Shavana, manana, nididhyasa. Then what happens? The next lines. 
अंत शरीर ज्योतिर्मयो हि शुभ्र यम पश्यंती यतय क्षीण दोषा दट वन यू सी दि प्योर इल्यूमिनेशन द रेडिएशन Uh, in, in the in the within this body uh, the light of of the self the self which is pure consciousness you realize that yang pashyanti that which is seen where is it seen shankaracharya here gives his commentary antar sharire sharir um, antar madhye sharirasya in the body pundarika akash in the lotus of the heart jyotirmaya luminous luminous jyotirmaya hi rukma varnam a golden luminosity shubhra um, white radiance or, or 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 pure pure radiance actually shuddha yamatmanam what is that the self it's you it's your real nature as consciousness so don't say my consciousness it's a very strange thing to say i say actually if we think about it i am consciousness i am awareness everything else is that which is presented to awareness if you say my body yes the body is presented to awareness my thoughts my personality that's presented to awareness you are this awareness this consciousness but which consciousness it is this um this radiance this pure radiance in which there is no materiality no body no mind so that one you realize what do you do you see that no you don't see that you realize that you are that who who realizes He says, "Yataya, yataya, the monks, Krishna dosha, whose um, impurities have been reduced or uh, who have been thinned out. Attenuated is the word that is used. Impurities. One is the vasanas, the accumulated desires and tendencies in our subconscious mind. They have been purified. Also, which lead to the flickering mind, the mind which races here and there. That has been calmed down. So the defects have been." um purified defects have been, the mind has been purified the word for that is chitta shuddhi purification of the mind so these monks their minds have been purified the hearts have been purified in the bible blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see god literally that so they have become pure of heart um and he says monks now usually vedanta is monastic quite a bit and shankaracharya makes it even more so even when the original text doesn't mention monks he will bring in monks but here he has it easy because the original text does mention monks yataya these monks so the mundaka upanishad one of the meanings of mundaka is the shaven head this one so the mundaka upanishad is often associated with monks and here you see words like this yataya the monks but what is meant here is sri ramakrishna used to say antare tag the inner renunciation the one who holds on to truth the one who is intensely focused on god or on on self realization and the one who is chaste that one shri ramakrishna would say is a monk internally externally maybe a householder maybe in the midst of um, of society holding a job um, doing stuff uh, having a family but internally in bengali bhetore sadhu that is uh, a monk internally and sri ramakrishna would say for those who are formally monks there would be internal renunciation and external renunciation but one thing that is not compromised with is this internal renunciation that's a that's absolutely essential the monk who has renounced externally but not internally is in a disastrous situation there is a saying among um, people in the north of india it translates into you have colored your cloth without coloring your mind you know colored your cloth this you have colored your cloth the color of uh, ochre which is the this ochre is the sign of renunciation well you have colored the cloth but what a tragedy oh yogi you haven't colored your mind so the mind is still worldly so that should not be first most important is the inner renunciation and another meaning of this yataya is yatana shilaha sankaracharya says those who are constantly trying none of that i leave it to god no this person would be up and doing if he wanted money if he wanted power relationships facebook likes how much up and doing we are to get the things we want 
And so if you really honestly desire God, you will be up and doing. Whether it's Vedanta, whether it's med meditation, whether it is an austere life, uh, we would be up and doing. And so one of the meanings of the word yati, uh, Shankaracharya says, yatana shila, those who are hard at work, those who are constantly making efforts for spiritual realization. Sanyasinaha, Shankaracharya is very clear here, monks. And what are the faults that have been attenuated or thinned out? Kshina krodha di chitta malaha. Their uh, anger and greed and lust and the dirt of the mind has been purified, cleansed. Such people will realize. Realize what? That pure light in the heart, which is their own real nature. All right. This is the meaning of this particular verse, mantra. One more quickly and then the second one repeats, re-emphasizes. Um, something which was said in this mantra. Fifth mantra, then the sixth mantra re-emphasizes the importance of truth. Importance of truth. Number six. Satyam eva jayate nanritam Satyena pantha vitato devayana Yena akramantya rishayo yapta kama Yatra tat satyasya paramam nidhanam Like a poem to truth, the importance of truth. Truth alone wins and not untruth. By truth is laid the path of the gods by which the desireless seers ascend to where exists the supreme treasure attainable through truth. Inspiring mantra. And here you have it. So this Satya Meva Jayate, every Indian knows it. So this is the national motto of India. After the independence of India, after India became a republic in 1950, when the national emblem, Ashoka Stamba, it was adopted as the national emblem of India. On that emblem, it's written, uh, Satya Meva Jayate, truth alone prevails. And that's taken from this Upanishad. This is the one which has been taken there. So it's the national motto of India. And in fact, all Indian currency, Indian currency bears that Satya Meva Jayate, truth alone prevails. So this Upanishads, they have a lot of Quotable lines, you know, <laughs> and uh, this is a very famous one. So it comes from this mantra of the Mundaka Upanishad. Truth alone prevails, non ritam not untruth. Shankaracharya he, uh, comments here: Prasiddham loke satya vadina anrita vad uh, vadya abhibhuyate anrita vadya abhibhuyate na viparjaya ata siddham satyasya balavat sadhanatvam. It is well known in the world. That it is the truthful man who overcomes the, the liar, the untruthful man. But I'm glad he thinks it's well known. People seem to doubt it all the time. No, but he says it's, it's well known. The one armed with truth overcomes the liar, the, the untruthful one. And not the other way around, he says. Na viparjaya. And therefore it is established, he says, the um, satyasya balavat sadhanatvam. That truth is the most powerful practice. The most power of all spiritual practices, truth is the most powerful spiritual practice. The effort, the sacrifice, it uh, requires to lead a principled life in this world. Um, that is essential for success everywhere, especially in spiritual life. Even if one is not successful in the world, one is indifferent, uh, success is indifferent in terms of money or popularity or politics or whatever it is, one will be successful in spiritual life. And without truth, there's no question of being uh, successful in spiritual life. And then there's a beautiful sentence. The path of the gods is laid out with truth. You know, what's the concrete? What's the, um, what's the material out of which the path of the gods is, is made? It's made of truth. The way of the gods is spread, spread out with truth. Who walks on that path? Yena akramanti rishayo yapta kama. I will come to that. Um, this path of the gods, devayana, it could just mean the path of spiritual realization. That's in general meaning. But there's a technical meaning. Um, there are these two paths which one takes after death. 
there is this pitriyana and devayana there is the path of the forefathers so depending on our past good karma if one is not a spiritual seeker depending on our past good karma we go to one of many heavens stay there for a long time come back to this world again uh, and continue our journey in another human birth so this is the path of the forefathers but there is the path of the gods devayana which is those who are spiritual seekers but who have not attained enlightenment in this life in this birth they go by this path they do not go to any of the lower heavens in order to come back to the world no they will not come back this is called krama mukti sequential liberation you go from here to the highest heaven dwell there with god and attain to full knowledge so that's the that's the technical meaning of the path of the gods you can take it either way just the vedantic path leading to enlightenment and freedom that's the path of the gods or this particular meaning of after death the person who is not yet enlightened will ascend to higher worlds to to the highest heaven from which there is no return to this path of path of the gods but it's built on truth what else who walks on this apta kama those whose desires are fulfilled not that a person who has ordered everything on uh, amazon prime and you know maxed out their credit cards and desires are fulfilled no not in that sense who have nothing more to look for in this world and have nothing more they have they have understood the limits of um this human and heavenly pleasures they are not looking for something limited to satisfy themselves they are in fact looking for the unlimited they are looking for um, they are looking for god not for anything worldly and he gives some qualifications kuhaka maya shatya ahankara dambha anrita vajjita these are some of the qualifications those who are free of deceit multiple words for deceit maya this uh, nature of illusory deceiving others you know, what do you call it putting a spin on things that is kuhaka putting a spin on things shatya crookedness ahankara ego dambha uh, arrogance anrita general falsehood all of this one has to be cleansed of all of these sri ramakrishna would sometimes send people he said go and visit niranjan see he would say see how simple he is and sri ramakrishna valued simplicity sharalata the word um, in indian language for simplicity is the same thing for straight saral means straight and saral means simple so simplicity straightforwardness sri ramakrishna said in one's last birth one becomes simple we um, you know sophisticated society does not um, does not uh, value simplicity because so it thinks it's it seems like a, it's not cool it's not it's a lack of uh, sophistication no i read this uh, quotation somewhere he says nothing confounds the clever so much as simplicity those who are clever in life this one thing that they can't they can handle other clever people they can handle stupid people but they can't handle simple people nothing confounds the clever so much as simplicity remember these beings they are they are simple but they are not stupid at all they are child like but they are not childish and they in fact have an intelligence which is profound and deep in front of them the rest of us if we think ourselves worldly wise and clever we are more like uh, mischievous grandchildren in in front of a grandfather or a, or a grandmother who understands us thoroughly and is indulgent with us we think the child grandchild thinks that he or she is fooling the grandparent of course you are not the grandparents knows you thoroughly but uh, it just indulgent it just loving and indulgent and slowly will guide us towards uh, towards uh, a spiritual realization so a variety of things putting a spin on things um what we call today fake news uh, kind of illusoriness showing what one is not 
In fact, psychologists say that the greatest amount of psychic energy we all lose in trying to put up a facade, in trying to show others what we would want them to see us at. It's always a failure and it's exhausting. Then on this path of the truth, they walk. So the path is truth and yatra satyasya paramam nidhanam. Where, do, where are they walking to? Where lies the greatest of treasures, which is truth itself. So the goal is truth with a capital T, with a capital R, the real, Atman, Brahman, reality itself. And the way to that goal is, is uh, spread out with truth. He says, the treasure, um, satyasya uttama sadhanasya, the best spiritual practice, which is truth. And what is the, uh, it's the means, he says, sadhana is the means. The best means for becoming enlightened is truth. This is the means. Then what is the end? Sambandhi sadhyam. The end related to this means the, is paramam prakrishtam nidhanam. It is the greatest treasure of all. Purushartha rupena. It is present as the goal of human life, the end of all human endeavors, which is moksha, liberation, freedom. Iti nidhanam. Therefore, it is a treasure. It's the greatest of treasures that lies at the end of this path. Yeah. So the path to enlightenment is made of truth and enlightenment itself is truth. That's the greatest uh, treasure. Yeah. Let's take a look at the comments. Priya says, would a person be less reactive, more patient after enlightenment in his interactions? Absolutely. One sign of uh, spiritual development is a reduction in reactivity. It takes energy and power to react to something, but it takes much more energy, much more power to hold back. Um, Swami Vivekananda gives the example. The chariot which Krishna is controlling. Now, imagine the amount of energy in those charging horses which will pull the chariot along at a breakneck speed. But imagine the power that's required to hold those charging horses back. That's even more. So to hold back, to be in charge of our reaction, that is a core in yoga. A, a, a core ability in yoga. Not to immediately hit back. Not to immediately say stuff. Not to immediately jump to conclusions. Not to immediately do something. But to stop. And then upon proper deliberation, do, say, uh, think. Think, say and do. Kaya Manavakya with the three levels. Uh, something that has been you know, beautiful words of the Upanishads. Purified by thought. When you process it through thought, through wisdom, and then it's expressed uh, in language and in action. Yeah. But that re requires, first of all, holding back reaction. Sa Sanket says, one pointed focus easier when one is younger. Does that mean enlightenment is only for the young? No. It's not really easier when one is younger. It is easier when the mind is trained. So, whether we're young or old, uh, we must make an attempt at training the mind. Do whatever works for you. If a mantra works for you, good. Many people, reading works for them. Some serious reading, especially sp spiritual reading, it calms down the mind. It is the closest one can get to meditation without actually meditating. Christian monastics had a practice of contemplative reading. So they would take a, a, a passage of scripture and slowly read it through. Um, maybe loudly at first. In old days, the only kind of reading was reading aloud. They wouldn't read in their mind. And read it through. And read it through. And read it through. And then stay in silence. And again, read it through. Swami Turiyanji says, when he was in the little hut on the bank of the Ganga and the foothills of the Himalayas in Haridwar, he would uh, uh, take up the mantras from the Upanishads. He memorized eight Upanishads there and the verses from the Gita, and he would meditate for hours and days together, all together on, days together on one verse. And he says a flood of, his words, a flood of light would come on the meaning of that verse. 
Sonali says here, Pashyanti means realization of the infinite consciousness that I am. In Mahaji described it's golden light in, in the heart, just symbolic of light of consciousness. Yes. But remember, um, because the earlier description was of the golden hued bird, the higher bird is of a golden hue, Rukmavarnam. So, so that is being referred to here. Just, just the light of consciousness. Light is used as a metaphor here. Not that it's actually shining with light, but it is. It's brighter than all lights because that's the light which reveals all light. Whether a room is lit up or not, how do you know? Only because you are aware. You are the light of lights. Another way of referring to consciousness is Jyoti Rajyoti, light of lights. When John says, in activity there is silent awareness when I check in and attentive to that. And the attention can move away to get involved in the mind. What is it that allows or moves the attention away from the wholeness or Brahman? Is this just a propensity of the mind? All right, that's a good question. You know what it is actually? At its root, it's the ignorance which does not appreciate consciousness for what it truly is. I'll repeat that. Consciousness is first and foremost you. It is I. First. Second, consciousness is ever the same. It actually does not get involved with, with the mind and the body. It only seems to. From the mind's perspective, here it is. From the mind's perspective, sometimes the mind appreciates, the mind which is well trained in Vedanta, appreciates its innermost nature as consciousness. Sometimes it does not. The mind gets busy with the world. And the mind thinks consciousness has become involved with the world. It hasn't. It never has. It's always all right. And therefore, you are always all right. Another beautiful way I was reading, there was a great Vedantin called Krishnananda, At Atmananda Menon, Krishna Menon, Atmananda, Krishna Menon in Kerala in the 1950s and 60s. He made two points about feelings and thoughts. This is, this is exactly his language. And language itself is, is very pristine, precise and meditative. He says, notice how all feelings arise from peace and subside back into peace. Therefore, the real nature of all feelings is peace. Notice how all thoughts arise in awareness and subside back into awareness. Therefore, the real nature of all thoughts is awareness. Whether you are thinking or feeling, always know that your real nature is awareness, which is peace itself. That last one I paraphrased. He said your real nature is awareness and peace. Even when you are thinking, even when you are feeling, does that make sense? Then Sonali says, related to the previous comment, please can you dis differentiate between attention and awareness? Awareness or consciousness is always there. Chit or Chaitanya. Attention is focused through the mind. Mind and the senses are used. You know, um, it is um, you know, focused on particular objects and you attend to different objects. So attention is like a narrow beam which is sweeping across. But light itself is, is uh, akin to awareness. You are aware all the time. But attention is ever changing. And uh, control over attention is that practice called focus or concentration. And it's very important. Control over attention is very important. Um, the Hargava Teja says, as listening to the last before class again, Mentioned different layers of reality in terms of atomic reality and social reality. Oh, did I? I've forgotten already. Similar to different schools of Vedanta and Swamiji's quote from lower truth to higher truth. All right. Amira says, in your example about the senior monk who lost his japamala and said its work is done, does it indicate jnana yoga superior to bhakti or can the practices go in hand in hand? Practices can go hand in hand for us, but Advaita Vedanta is quite clear. Jnana yoga comes after uh, upasana or worship. And so, yes, I never thought of that that way. But the Swami's direct experience seems to indicate the stages. 
repetition of a mantra and then realization of the truth of what the Upanishads are saying. And the, so for him, listening to the Upanishads is like pointing constantly to the to a reality, which is already he knows. Oh, there's a quote from St. Francis of Assisi. Pure, holy simplicity confounds all the wisdom of this world and the wisdom of the flesh. Yes, very beautifully put. Francis of Assisi. Holy simplicity confounds all the wisdom of this world and the wisdom of the flesh. Bhargava says a complex life might be exciting but very much energy draining. Yes, so that's the very definition of rajas. One should experience it a little bit when you are young and new to the city here, to Manhattan, and you have got a job on Wall Street. Good. Uh, all uh, weekdays you are earning money and weekends you are partying. Not bad, but very quickly you see through that. If you are doing that 10 years later, there is something wrong with you. If you do that for 6 months, 1 year, 2 years, good. <laughs> you have seen what it's like and then quickly move on to something that is more mature. Abhijit says, before enlightenment, yes, <laughs> chop wood, fetch water, after enlightenment, chop wood, fetch water, yes, but there's a very big difference. Um, so, as far as spiritual practices are concerned, before enlightenment, those are practices which will take us to enlightenment. After enlightenment, um, they are expressions of that enlightenment, and of course, the enlightened one might be doing it as an, what is called loka sangra, uh, as an ideal set for the rest of us, the path which we have to follow. Good. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Sat Sat Shri Ramakrishna Rupanamastu